So I wanted to ask. So a lot of people in, in uh, Iran used to admire Turkey, like uh, a, a decade ago before Erdogan came in and he before made Erdogan, yes. Yeah. So they do they still admire Turkey right now? Um, less, much less than before. I mean, they still think it's much better than Islamic. Okay, they they only acknowledge that it's better than Iran. Yeah, they but at some point it. of time they were fancying Turkey way too much. Right? Yeah, no, 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 no. Because of Erdogan's Islamic uh, speech and you know the way of thinking, and also they don't they don't admire it the same way that they used to, but they still acknowledge that it's so much better than Iran. I mean, that's my feeling. That's the sense that I get. I don't have any polls or anything like that. Uh, so, what's role model for uh, Iran right now? Because Turkey was sort of closer to Turkish culture, was sort of closer to Iran in that sense. So, what's I've seen so many. Role? Okay, so I've seen people. Um, some people look at uh, Europe and their human rights. Okay, and a lot of people say that's unrealistic. At, at the end of the day, Iran is in the Middle East, so that is too far ahead for you guys to want something like that. So, in response, they look at the personal liberties that people have in Dubai, uh, and yeah, they look at the they look at the UAE and Kuwait maybe, and even sometimes yeah, even sometimes they look at how girls can just walk around without a job in Lebanon. They're like. Why is it if this is Islamic, how come we're the only how come it's only like the Islamic Republic of Iran and ISIS and Taliban are the only three groups that are mandating the hijab? Like every other Islamic country is not mandating this. Why is this the only place that does this? Like um I mean even in Palestine, people is not mandated. Hijab is not mandated. But they they a lot of them are now looking at Saudi Arabia even. Um, and they're like, look, this is supposed to be the heart of the Islamic world. And they're having concerts and they're serving alcohol and they have personal liberties. And stuff like that. I don't agree with them as looking at Saudi Arabia because the Saudi Arabia, the liberties that they have is mostly... But Saudi Arabia is also a good model. It's giving liberties gradually. Yeah, yeah, but, the, yeah. but it's also taking away liberties. So uh, yeah, but... Um, Saudi Arabia is giving is giving liberties when it comes to driving cars. It's kind of like a lipstick on a pig when it comes to concerts, drinking alcohol, um, wearing the clothing that you want and stuff. But when it comes to dissent and free speech, um, th those liberties are actually less than before, not more than before. Yeah, and it's actually, killing dissidents left, right, and center. Uh, yes, there was. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's more important. That's a more important freedom that you know. I want to like when in my show in my Persian show I want to introduce people that that is actually the most important liberty that you like don't if you're picking and choosing liberties if you're taking away your power to speak against the government and giving you some other freedoms that's not a trade off that you want okay because those other liberties that you're getting they're on the government's time like they can without your power of dissent um every any liberty that you have it's just a gift that could be taken away from you. With the liberty of free speech and expression and dissent, the other liberties that come are the ones that you took by force. It wasn't given to you voluntarily. You took it, and it's harder to take it away from you because you took it by force from the government. So the freedom of expression and of speech is more important than the freedom of wearing, it, wearing what you want or drinking alcohol or partying. Do you think that eventually Saudi Arabia would go there? Uh, with dissent, like it could become like you eventually, slowly by slowly. I think, I think, um, it could right become now, like this, UK. It, it can, but not willingly. Like this regime is not thinking, this regime wants a tighter control over its people when it comes to speech. If that ever happens, it's because they have failed, it's because they have, because maybe a drop in oil prices or something like that. But they are like st uh, starting to build the institutions around uh, the systems. When you bring in institutions, gradually the power of monarchy will uh, slow down. That's what happened in Brit uh, Britain, actually. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, if that ha I'm not saying that's not going to happen. I'm saying if it happens, it's not because they chose it. 
That's not what they want. They want tighter control on the people. Yeah, but when they build a proper efficient institution, it's going to happen. The institutions the institu will have yeah, they're not a lot of power. They're not, building, they're not building proper institutions. The institutions that they're building are supposed to be arms of the government. For my, like Iran also built very powerful institutions. But the institution were supposed to develop institutions that their job was to keep people in their place. They were arms of the republic, um, and their mandate was to enforce the rules and the laws. But if you go a democratic way, uh, I think China shouldn't go a democratic way directly. There should be a what? gradual progression. Yeah, uh, I know there's better. a gradual yeah, but Saudi Arabia is not doing a gradual. Pro I'm not. I'm not saying it needs to be a radical shift. Okay, but Saudi Arabia is not doing a gradual uh, um, pr progress in the right way. It's going the opposite way. You, people keep saying like, "Oh, Armin, what do you expect from Saudi Arabia? Progress takes time." I know progress takes time. I don't want everything to be free overnight. I know these things take time, but Saudi Arabia is going in the wrong direction. I think it's it isn't it becoming more like UAE with invest uh, outside no, investments it's becoming less like, no, yeah okay it's becoming less like that there's less tolerance for speech against the regime than before yeah but because uh, I think a lot of say, a lot, I think a lot of people are in love with the aesthetics too in so love with true. The aesthetics so true so true you know they like they don't see the foundations of what makes a true democracy, true liberty, and they they get distracted with concerts and women, uh, you know, and partying and stuff. And I think that that distracts them from what needs to be fixed from the core. I see, don't this think is they're... why this is why actually, this is why I like the protest in Iran because they clarify that it's not about the hijab, like. When they take off their hijab, a lot of people are like, oh, these women, they want the freedom to want the, uh, to take off their hijab. And they're like, no, I, I'm taking off the hijab because this, this is the, the symbol of the regime. They, they chant, hijab faqad bahunas, asla nizam nishunas, which means the hijab is an excuse. Our target is the foundations of the regime. That's their chant. Okay, so but there's something called anarchy, which a lot of nations would like, even the population would like to become, uh, if you give too much freedom, it could lead to a lot of anarchy. So it makes sense to have certain amount of control. So Saudi Arabia is that like, is, it that will is a give bizarre you line, freedom. Oxymoron, that is such oh. a bizarre line to use at this point, okay? When you have, nobody is advocating for no law and order. It's so bizarre to say that at the face of absolute tyranny to tell people that there's some law or an order that is required who is asking for no law and order i'm not talking that about is, iran i'm talking about no, saudi you know anybody like in, in saudi when you have tyrants like saudi or in saudi arabia or in iran to go and use the line that obviously some law and order is required is, is means that you're completely have lost what this is all about who is asking for zero law and order? When you when you talk about law and order, when we're dealing with tyrants, like, yes, we don't need this level of control. We need less level. Everybody's asking for a lesser level of control compared to what tyrants are enforcing upon people. They're not asking for no law and order. In no, fact, they're asking that's for... How, in fact, that's how the in movement... Fact, in fact, in fact, the, they are asking for law and order, for the international law and order. They're not asking for, they're asking for the enforcement of the law and order that is internationally is recognized against human rights violations. So this is, a, know, this is not an anti-law and order advocacy that they, these people the, are demanding. The, uh, uh, this argument could be used against my McCarthyism that was practiced in U USA. Say that again? Do you know McCarthyism? So the McCarthy, uh, during yes, the communist yes. movement that the was care. set. Yeah, so they used to use the same argument that they were argue, advocating for better law and order, but better institutions. So, uh, United States. You're, you're, God damn it. Okay, everybody 
again, here's the thing. Everybody is asking for law. Your analogy makes absolutely no sense. Okay. Obviously, everybody is asking for certain laws on laws and order. That's my point. Okay. You're saying, oh, without law and order, we would have anarchy. Well, nobody's asking for that. Nobody's asking for that. The Iranian regime is asking for certain laws and order. The Iranian people who are protesting against the regime, they're asking for a different kind of law and order. The Iranian regime, for example, wants a Sharia-based law and order. The Iranian people want a secular democratic-based law and order. In Saudi Arabia, there is law and order. The law and order, the law is wrong in Saudi Arabia. The fact that if you speak against the regime, you get killed for it, that's the wrong law. People are not saying to remove all law. They're saying replace the laws. Yeah, but uh, say the regime uh, the, in Saudi Arabia, it, it, it's responsible for whatever good, have, good is happening and what's bad happening in Saudi Arabia. So I think the Saudi Arabia I is heard... incredibly, uh, incredibly, uh, incredibly rich country. Uh, and... Uh, I already the, made my point about this. Regime in Saudi Arabia is fighting against dissent more than it has ever been before, and that is wrong. And I stand against that. Yeah, anything because else, it's, it's anything being else, made vulnerable. It's horrible. It's like it, it, this is the wrong way. And I, as a human rights advocate, I stand against Saudi Arabia's regime. And I also recognize that every freedom that it's getting is doing it out of desperation. It's doing it out of desperation because it's running out of cash and it needs tourism money. So it doesn't require any congratulation for what it's doing. It's being forced well said, into a corner. I think well it's said, the um, market uh, markets they are playing into Saudi Arabia that are doing this. Uh, yeah, because so. they have to replace this because they are they know that they will not be able to maintain the current uh, the economic that they have right now. They know that the oil money is not going to be there forever. So the market is forcing them to give into certain freedoms just and they own they have to only they only want to give the freedoms that attracts investment and tourist money not the freedom that the, the saudi people deserve to be, to build their own future to take control over their own destiny all they want is more money flowing in to and the money that they would be using to for, to enforce their own law and to con maintain their own power over their own people not the money that would be, f uh, be flowing freely in the hands of the people that will empower them against the regime that's what do you think uh, do, uh, Indians have a lot more freedom, uh, let's say, for example, than Saudis do? Yeah. Do you think yes. uh, India is in better state than Saudi? Generally, uh, average Indian is better state than an average, average uh, Saudi person. Freedom-wise, yes. But economically, um, if you want to look at Saudi Arabia, what the oil gushing out of the ground that is not a blessing that you could congratulate the regime for. I mean, money there is, is a, Venezuela money, turned into hell, hell. So money is okay. You're Aksumaran, I can't talk to you anymore. You're jumping from one country to another now, Venezuela. Like you, you don't have any. When you're talking, you don't have any organized way to make your points. Now, forget Venezuela. Okay, the regime of Saudi Arabia has literally money flowing out of the ground. Okay, and many many Saudis are living better lives there. But again. A lot of people are living miserable lives in Saudi Arabia, even with all that, all that oil coming out of the ground, okay? Especially people who are immigrants there. Immigrants there are treated like goddamn slaves, like slaves. There is no excuse for any poor person in Saudi Arabia with all that money coming out of the ground. The fact you're like, oh, some people in on average in Saudi Arabia have better lives than India. With all that money coming out of the ground, nobody should feel any any poverty. Like, look at Norway. They have oil. Nobody has any poverty in Norway. Saudi Arabia, the fact that they even have a single poor person in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia is a shame. The amount of wealth uh, gap between the rich and poor is, is, is disgusting in Saudi Arabia. They could have they could have had a life a, a enriched life for everybody there, but they don't. They still have a lot of poor people. How could you possibly still have poor people with all that money? Because so many people have collected that money for themselves, because they didn't let it just freely pro, um, flow through the economy. And you're like, oh, so many people have. How could they not? Is that is that because of the blessings of the regime? Have they had good policies? They have managed to waste so much of their money on things that didn't have any results. The reason why they're wealthy is because of so much wealth that is coming out of the ground. It's not because of their management. Their management has been so extremely poor. Look at how much, look at, look at with all that wealth, they couldn't even defeat Yemenis. Their management sucks. 
they know they don't even know how to organize like they they, they people that were like fighting with them with slippers people they had the, they had billions of dollars worth of weaponry 300 billions of dollars worth of weaponry from the most advanced country in the world that bought it and they were fighting with p- people that had Kalashnikovs with slippers and they couldn't defeat them because they suck at management they can't manage anything okay yeah, so Kaim, my point is well, my point no, is on. whatever no, 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 bad no, no. or good no, no. hold on Ibn Kaim had this mic on open mic Go yeah no no um I, I do agree with you with regards to Yemen I mean they were useless Saudi Arabia I mean <laughs> The, the, I mean, the Yemenis, uh, the, the Houthis were so overmatched in terms of firepower. The fact that they still were able to contest that war was incredible. Um, now, my, my brother, he actually taught in Saudi Arabia. He was actually a teacher. He, he, he went there to teach. Um, and he said, you know, a lot of people say, like, for example, they say oil is a curse to an extent, right? Oil is a yeah. curse. And we can see that. We can see that in Venezuela. We can see that uh, propping up the uh, Iranian regime. And, and we do see that in the, in the Gulf countries as well. Uh, but Saudi Arabia, w- one of the things it has completely eliminated is illiteracy. So, for example, prior to uh, the oil uh, boom, I think less than, this was in the 40s or 50s, less than 20% of the population could read, read and write. Today, that's 97.5% of the population can read and write in Saudi Arabia. It's only people who are in their 80s or 90s. You know, some of them are unable to read and write. But that's um, the world. Another... That's the world. No, no, it's no, no. But, like, but in Iran, for example, it's got 15% illiteracy rate, right? Which is one in six people, even with the... Uh, with Wait, the even with Iran? The, yeah, 15% illiteracy rate in Iran. So even with the, uh, the amount of oil... That, that's coming out there. The regime has failed to, to eliminate literacy. And they had a head no, start it, on Saudi Arabia. It, it's 85% in Iran. 80, yeah, so, 85%. 85 no, 15, 15% illiteracy. Illiteracy. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. No, not, not 15% literacy. <laughs> that would be lower than Afghanistan. <laughs> okay. Well, I was like, what are you talking about? Okay. I, okay. Hold on. Let me see. Saudi. I was like, what the hell are you talking Sa- about? Sa- Saudi Arabia, the, the, the illiteracy rate is about 3% now. Um, so one of the things they have done with that money is, is eliminate I mean, they've invested a bit in education. I mean, it was probably not the right kind of education up until about, say, five to ten years ago. Uh, but the level of education they're getting now, it's, it's similar to what you would get in Western Europe. It's not that far off, you know, in terms of the quality. Um, yeah. and in, 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 they, in, they, hire a lot of, they hire a lot of American and foreign... Um, yeah, foreign. for the international schools they do. For the international schools they do. Um, yeah. And a lot of people in Saudi Arabia speak it with an English accent. To have your questions answered on the next live stream, become my patron today. You can do so with as little as $1 a month. Link in the description below.